In this panel, sustaining high impact investments, school and classroom level, we'll hear how recovery investments in Jackson, Georgia are impacting student and staff well-being at the middle school. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Suzanne Harris, the principal at Henderson Middle School. With 18 years in education, including 10 as an administrator, Dr. Harris has been honored as the Georgia Association of Secondary School Principals 2023 Middle School Principal of the Year. She currently serves on the GASSP Executive Board and represents Georgia on the National Association of Secondary School Principals Board of Directors. Carter Glover, an eighth grader at Henderson Middle School, is with us as well today. Carter plays the oboe in the band, is a member of the Junior Beta Club, and is co-captain of the Henderson Middle School soccer team. Her current hopes and dreams for the future include graduating from college with a degree in aerospace engineering and working at NASA. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you once again for having us here. I want to give a quick shout out to our state superintendent, Woods, over here. I'm pretty sure he wasn't expecting that, but all right. Um, but I'm Dr. Suzanne Harris, like uh, she said before, and I'm Carter Glover. All right, and we are very excited to be here to, to tell our story. Um, and I wanted to tell our story through the lens of social emotional learning and how our, we had to go through that struggle. And you're looking at a principal who almost quit. My teacher doesn't know she's right here. I almost quit because I did not have the skills in navigating what life was like post COVID. Before COVID, yes, they did talk about social and emotional learning. We did talk about it as the new thing, you know, is it gonna go away? But then COVID hit and it wasn't just a new thing. It was the thing that I had to navigate and I did not have the skills. So Carter is gonna share with us real quick. Carter, what was it like before, well, you were a fifth grader at the time. Um, what was it like at our school when you were coming through the halls to see your mom when you were going to her room? So my mom's a teacher at Henderson and I had sisters that went to Henderson at this time. And they would tell me stories about all the fights in the lunchrooms and in the hallways. And when I went to the school after, like after school, I would be scared to go in the hallways because you never know what would happen and like lockdowns and we would have we would have to get like escorted to our classroom sometimes and they wouldn't tell us and it was just overall pretty scary mm -hmm. to be in. Okay. So she was going through that as an elementary school student coming into the middle school. And like I said, COVID happened and all COVID did was exaggerated all of those things, right? So before I even go further, I wanted to tell you a little bit about our school um, and our district at large, but our school is, we have around 842 students um, every year, give and take, you know, with kids leaving, kids coming. Uh, we are 100% um, free and reduced, so we're a Title I school. Um, we have 32% African American, 54% white, and um, we have about 12% students with disability. Um, this particular data right here, or oh, before I even talk, start talking about this, so Butts County is located an hour south of Atlanta on a, you know, during peak hours. And outside of peak hours, about 25 to 30 minutes south of Atlanta. So there's a big difference, right? So, <laughs> so that's where we're located. And right now we're located in the hub of, it's like a logistics hub right there. Like things are booming in our area, but our kids were struggling and we weren't addressing that. So economically, we were doing great. On the other side, we were not. So I have a quick little activity for you to do, and let's see if anybody can figure this out. So we use Rethink Ed, and this is one of the, um, the social emotional um, programs that we, we've used the ESSER funds for to kind of track our students' perception of their own social emotional needs. Can you tell me who the gifted kids are? Can you tell me who the cheerleaders are? Can anybody tell me? Who wanna guess who the bully is? Can you tell who the bullied kid is? You can't, right? Can you tell me who the regular student is? This is students' perception data on how they feel about their own social emotional learning skills. What we're seeing here, we have students saying that I'm struggling with self-management. I'm struggling with self-awareness. Some kids are struggling with all things. If you look at the bottom, Third one, that student is struggling with self-management, self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills. 
resp responsible decision-making skills. So kids are coming to our school every day and they're struggling. This didn't happen just because of COVID. This was happening before. Most principals didn't have the skills to deal with this. I'm a, I'm a turnaround leader. All I worry about is instructional leadership, because that's what they told me. You're an instructional leader, and that's what I worried about. And then COVID happened, and I wanted to quit, right? I wanted to get out the game because I did not know how to master this part, because it's different. So no, you can't tell who's who, because all kids were going through something at the time. So we had to create a little honeycomb of what are the things that we needed to do to make sure that we're helping our students. Thank God for the ESSA funds because we were able to pay for um, training and capturing kids' hearts because that's one of the things we realized that not just me as a principal, but my teachers did not, did not know how to handle the behaviors that were in our classrooms. So we figured, okay, what's the best way to connect with our kids, help them learn the behaviors that they need to learn, and we realized that we had to get some training of our own, and we also had to put structures in place so that way it's not just a one-hit thing. Oh, we're going to do training on social emotional learning, and then that's it forever. Because sometimes that's what we do, right? So it's a, it's a very tangled web that we weave, but we, we, we wove, okay, listen, grammar and all that stuff right now, y'all give me a pass. <laughs> but listen, <laughs> so we had to look at how do we give students access to us as adults? So that's one of the things that we looked at. Um, we looked at student assembly time. Cafeteria time is one of those big, that's everyday assembly, right? How do we make that time work for us? Uh, we looked at, do they have access to the counselors? Do they know how to access the counselors? We looked at, are, do we have time protected in the school day for students to interact with adults and to interact with each other outside of academics? But those are all good. But what is the true training that we needed? And we realized that we don't know how to build relationship with kids. Before COVID, we were teaching them ABCs one, two, three. And then COVID occurred and ABC one, two, three meant nothing to them anymore because they were at the home. They could Google stuff now. Everybody had access to technology, right? I don't need you to tell me how to do stuff. I can go Google it. AI can ask AI, it tells it to me. But that was not going to suffice. We had to build relationship with our kids. So capturing kids' hearts is one of the things that we use that funds for. Um, Rethink Ed was a way for us to capture how they felt, felt about their own needs. And also it gave us targeted instruction for how we can meet those needs. Um, core essentials, that's basic character ed. We take it for granted that kids know how to be nice and know how to be responsible, and they don't. Not any, not, and I can't say not anymore post-COVID because it was already existing pre-COVID. It's just that, like I said, we were all focused on academics. And then finally, we were looking at how well were we intervening with our students who needed additional supports on the academic side. And so we had to make sure that we were looking at PBIS in a different light. It wasn't just about how do we walk in the hallway? How do we raise our hand in the classroom? It was more about what is the specific area of, that you need support in, and then how do we provide that specific help in a, in a very um, intentional manner? And a lot of that went back to teacher training again. So this is kind of the, the plan that we had of how we were going to address our social and emotional learning needs at Henderson Middle School. So one of the things that, like I told you before, we recognized we did not have quality student adult relationships. We had to work on building that up. So Carter, can you tell us a little bit about some of your relationship with your teachers? Okay, so every year that I've been at Henderson, I've had like a student at Henderson, I've had at least one teacher that I knew I could talk to about anything. In sixth grade, it was my social studies teacher and I would go to her about almost anything. Like if I was having friend problems, if I felt like I just needed to talk to someone, I always knew I could go to her. In seventh grade, it was my science teacher. She also is my soccer coach. And she just always makes sure she can talk to us and that we know that we can talk to her about anything. This year, I have two. It's my math and my science teacher. And my science teacher, she doesn't make, she makes it like serious about work, but she also makes it a point to have a relationship with all of her students. And my math teacher recently, like she took time out of her day and spent her own money and did henna on a bunch of girls in her class. And it was just, Sorry. oh, it's all right. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it, it was important for us to share that story with y'all because that's not how it was before. I remember my first year at Henderson, you tell kids good morning and they're, that the head was down and they don't talk to us. Now I say, I go in the hall and I say, good morning, sixth grade. Get out the teacher's face and go to class. Go do some reading. They will not leave us alone, y'all. It's a beautiful thing. Because they're supposed to drop everything and read in the mornings, mm -mm. they want to talk to their teachers, but before they weren't. So it's a beautiful thing. I make joke about it, like, hey, leave the teacher alone. But no, it's beautiful to see a kid interacting with a trusted adult in the building because that was part of what we were missing. We we're missing authentic relationships outside of academics. Right? So this is a bunch of pictures, like you all, me and my banana suit, y'all, with the football players. But we're always finding time to connect with our students because it's helping with the academic side. Now they trust us. Now they want to be with us. And we're getting the results on the other side. Um, here's another piece that we had to work on was strengthening adult to, to adult relationships. Um, students were not the only ones who were struggling during COVID. We had a lot of adults who had spouses who lost jobs. We have adults who, um, they were leaving work all the time because kids were getting sick at their schools. Um, we had to make, be flexible with how we, we worked with our staff members because gone are the days where I can tell you now, hey, if you wanna leave, you can just leave. Teacher pipeline is not like that anymore, right? So I had to figure out how do I take care of my teachers to make sure that they wanna come back and they feel good about when they come into the building every day. And back to capturing kids' hearts, we had to learn how to build that authentic relationship with each other. So um, each grade level kind of runs their own show. We have some really good grade level chairs. And they're the ones who helps me to, um, they help me, sorry, to, to kind of get a pulse of the building. Dr. Harris, we have too many meetings going on. Okay, and I pull back. Yeah, like my pullback coach. Yeah, let me call him that. I'm a pullback coach. Um, they'll tell me, hey, we're having uh, lunch. Some of them eat too much, y'all. Like eighth grade, this is the one with the funny hat. They eat all the time. But that's the way that they take care of each other. They're very in tune with each other. Seventh grade, they do breakfast all the time. That's because they have first planning. And, but that's the way they kind of connect with each other because this job is hard. It's changed and it's hard. So they have to take time to take care of each other, take care of themselves outside of academics. All right, so um, we do have our type, we have a, the little tiger that we see here. Teachers are able to pass the tiger to honor somebody who's doing something well each week. And the person has to add, they have to add um, a little token on the tiger as a, to leave their little mark, and they pass it around at the end of the year. We take a picture of the tiger, and um, Ms. Ms. so I'm gonna put her on the spot. Ms. Glover, she's one of my teachers. Have you ever gotten the tiger? And then you pass it on and make somebody else feel good, right? So that's how we make sure that adult to adult relationships are positive in our building. Now, the other thing that we talked about was just students having direct access to adults. I remember the days when students used to email me, I need to change my class, all in one, the subject line. Has anyone ever received that? <laughs> like, hold up. So I had to shut the school down, like, listen, this is how you send an email, and this is how you ask for stuff. But once they understood how to get to me, they don't need a teacher, they don't have to make an appointment, all you have to do is email me. I have a folder in my email, so I always check it in the mornings because I find that our kids, they, if, if they can just have time to advocate for themselves, they'll do it. But we didn't, didn't give it to them before. We didn't give them that ad avenue. And um, through email, they're able to advocate. So this first one says, I want to thank you for being the best middle school principal. You are the nicest principal. The reason why this one is significant is up there is not because he shot at me out. The reason why it's there is because we had to teach them how to affirm each other and affirm themselves. They did not speak positively over themselves. So to get an email, and sometimes I'll tell them, hey, email somebody something nice. I didn't tell him to do this that morning. And he sent me an email affirming me, a boy. Right? Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah I, that was an important piece of detail right there. But I felt good that day, and I emailed him, and I said, thank you so much for affirming me. Because as principals, sometimes we need that. You know what I'm saying? The next one, good afternoon, Ms. Harris. I received the referral today, and I understand why. And the fact that I have to have some type of consequence. I just hope to still be able to attend the dance because my mom spent money that she didn't really have to get me some new clothes. I apologize and realize I made a mistake. He's advocating for himself. He still didn't get to come to the party because he had to get his consequence for what he did. But he understood how to advocate for himself. 
versus the old way. I can't stand y'all. Y'all don't, don't make me come to the party. Da, da, da. It's no more attitude. Just advocate. Because you never know. I might, have a, I might have a little sympathy for you. Not this time for what you did. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, it, but it was not, no, no hard feelings after because he understood. So that was big growth. That's another male. And the next one, good morning, Dr. Hyatt. That's, the, that's my old name. <laughs> Can you turn the volume down, please, um, from the morning music? So sometimes I play music over the intercom, jamming in, coming in in the mornings. And that is a self-contained special ed class. Students, because so the speaker is right over where they have breakfast in the mornings. And the students couldn't deal with all that noise. But a special ed student from a self-contained class was able to advocate. Because we're teaching them it's OK to speak up, but do it the right way. And guess what I stopped doing? I stopped playing the music club because it was not good for them, right? I do it a different way. I do it on the morning announcements, which is virtual. All right. Um, and then the last one. OK. Yes. All right. So the last one, and this one, and please excuse her name being there. But a student was being bullied by a male because of her hair. She's biracial, and she had big, beautiful, poofy hair. And that boy made fun of her. And she emailed me, she said, Dr. Harris, he's making fun of me, and I don't like it. So I called her in, and I kind of got an understanding of what was going on. And I said, we handled it. You know, I, I don't like when kids pick on other kids. And I told, and I asked her, I said, hey, I have some other biracial females in the school who do their hair, they straighten it, they do all kinds of styles. Can I bring them in and bring you in and we just have a, a talk about it and stuff? And she said, okay. I brought her, um, her in and three others. They were all eighth graders at the time. And they all had different types of hair. And they talked to her, they said, oh, make sure you use this product. Make sure when you're combing it out, you comb from this end and then you, go, you work your way up. And they advised her so well. And then I get this email. Thank you for helping me with my hair and letting me meet more people like me. Um, I'm a little bit more happier with my hair, so thank you very much. A kid said that because of now I'm understanding that those little interactions make a big impact. It's not about A, B, C, and one, two, three anymore. It's about the interactions that we're having, the positive interactions that we're having with students and being intentional about those interactions. So Carter, uh, so lunchtime at our school, like I said, lunchtime is when a lot of people get scared, um, but lunchtime is so boring for me. I go in there and I'm like, nothing to do in here, no fights, kids are, yeah, they don't need me. That's lunchtime. Can you talk to me about what lunchtime is like for you as an eighth grader? People are just minding their own business. Nothing, you, you're able to talk <laughs> to your teachers if you want to. You can talk to your friends if they're in your class. It's just nothing really happens in the lunchroom anymore. It's just a place where you can chill. And that's exactly what lunch should be. It shouldn't be a stressful time for kids. You know, um, when we looked at the data before I went, um, came into the school, majority of the fights occurred in the cafeteria. The structures weren't there. We didn't define what that time could look like. So we rearranged, so when we had to go, so during COVID, we were taking lunches to the classroom because you know we didn't want to be all communal or whatever, but we went, when I told my teachers we had to go back to the cafeteria, they got scared. PTSD took them, like, hey, we're gonna have to deal with fights again and all this stuff. And I, I had to earn their trust, like, no, we're gonna make sure it's right. So we came up with a way to arrange the, the lunchroom tables in kind of like classroom, little classroom nooks. And the teachers ha all have a chair at the corner of that little square. And what that did for us was it gave opportunities for students to have access to their teachers. Sometimes they're talking to them about nothing, just hey, just hey, how you doing today? And it's just conversations that they did not have that time defined before. Um, we also give students opportunities to talk to each other. The only thing they can't take to the cafeteria is a cell phone. Because cell phones, I still believe, are not they don't give positive social interactions, okay? Not right now, not at the middle school level. But they can bring their laptops. Some students are studying. Um, you have students, we watched the World Cup in the cafeteria. That's what we did. We were in there talking about goal. You know, it was ridiculous. We do push-ups. We do, um, one of my students challenged me. That's where we, uh, I failed at doing the um, bird piece. Yes, I failed <laughs> very miserably. But she won, fair and square. But that's what the cafeteria is for us all because we're teaching students how to interact with each other positively. Um, it's not a perfect science, y'all, but I think 
in four years, we've had only one fight in the cafeteria. True story. And one fight in four years is not a bad thing. I think that's a good record, right? But we made some little adjustments, all because we were learning how to really uh, um, cater to their social emotional learning needs. We would have never had that opportunity had we not um, gotten funding from ESSER, the ESSER fund, sorry, to put towards um, training teachers up in that area. Um, so on the flip side, so we had to make sure that our counseling program can handle what was coming to it, okay? Once again, we're gonna talk about access. Students did not really know how to get to the counselors. So one of my counselors came up with a, a form, a referral form, so students can say, hey, I need help with certain things. For example, I feel like hurting myself or someone else. Um, there's something, I, I just need to talk. Drama with my family, I am angry. So students can send this to the counselors and the counselors get the notification and pull the students in, or a student in, so they can talk to them about what's going on. You don't have to wait for a teacher to do it for you. You can do it for yourself. So this is some of our data. Um, we, what we see are the two top areas. I'm having problems with my peers. It's always a top area. You know, it's middle school. But the one at the bottom, I just need to talk. Sometimes they just want to talk, y'all. They're going through a lot. They're going through a lot. And school, how it's set up right now, doesn't offer them space to talk. So we want them to be able to, to ask to talk if they want to. And some of my emails come through. They're just, hey, Dr. Harris, could you please come into your office? I need to talk to you. They, will not, they, they know I'm a, see, they try to play me. They, tell, they don't tell me why they want to talk. Just so they, they, they know I'm going to call them in if I see a blank, like, hey, I don't need to talk. But if they, they, if they, they realize that if they say, hey, I need to talk about changing classes, <laughs> it's going to be a little bit, you know. It's going to be an email back, like, okay, what, you, what do you need? But they, when they want you, they want you. And it's important to give them that access. So um, this is how we track our data on how the students are using the counselors. Um, but I think it's been very important and, and effective for us. Small group counseling. During COVID at, at its peak, my counselors did not have time. Um, my counselors are stressed out. I lost two counselors last year, and luckily we were able to find two more. It was very hard to find counselors available to take the job because there's not a lot of them around anymore. Just like the teacher pipeline is um, not where it used to be, the counseling pipeline is not where it used to be. So luckily we found two highly trained counselors and we were able to go back in and start rebuilding our counseling program. So we're very intentional about small group counseling. We use the Rethink Ed per, uh, survey data that the students take and we look at where they think they have struggles, okay? So small group, we're looking for those students who are struggling in self-management and social skills. Those are your, the kids who come and want to fight and the kids who want to just be mean to others. And we're intentional about making sure they are learning skills and how to avoid those um, situations. Classroom guidance, same thing. We use the data from our Rethink Ed to make sure that we're targeting those areas of weaknesses on our campus. Empathy was one big one for us at the beginning of the year. And um, at the end of every, we call it unit, we do a self-assessment. Uh, we give the same questions for that particular area. Again, we re-administer it to the students and then we kind of see how well we're doing. So this first column shows a norm. In August with sixth grade, students were pretty much around the norm um, in some areas when it comes to empathy because they didn't know how to put themselves in other people's shoes, y'all. We gave the instruction, we did the classroom guidance, small groups, and also we did it in class, and we saw an increase in how they perceive themselves in terms of empathy. So we're giving specific treatment based on the data, and we're seeing growth after we reassess how they feel about their own social emotional learning skills, okay? But empathy was the one we started out the year with because that was a weakness across the board. All right, so Georgia gives out a student health survey every year, and the first one on the list, y'all, it doesn't hurt my feelings. Most days I look forward to going to school. They don't want to come to school. You know why? Because they don't want to do no work. But if you ask them if they like the people at school, they love them, you know? So it's like a misleading question in a way because they do like school for who they come to school for. But they don't necessarily want to come to school to work, okay? But it so I don't take that personally. I put it there on purpose. Um, but the kids are saying I feel connected to others at school. We're seeing um, our numbers go back to to being better than pre-COVID. Um, teachers' treatment with respect. 
we went from 81% in pre-COVID to 91%. So kids are feeling more like adults are respecting them. And that's because we've kind of learned how to, to, to interact with them a little bit more positively. Students at my school treat each other with respect. Before COVID was 46%, now we're at 56%. Um, I am open towards different opinions and perspectives. We've kind of um, balanced out there. So kids are able to see each other's side but not be as empathetic as I want them to be. But we're, we're working on that. Um, but this data is important for us to track because we want to know how effective our programming has been in terms of our counseling program and how well we're building their social emotional skills and how well they feel about themselves when it comes to school. The number, so this, I didn't show you all this first. I wanted to tell the story first, but this is where we started out. Pre-COVID, we had 1,500, over 1,500 referrals in a small middle school. COVID happened, school shut down, they had 872 referrals that year. And I remember my teacher saying that they were so happy that this COVID occurred because they didn't know how worse this was gonna get, all right? So, because uh, we shut down in what, March, April, May, so there was two more months of school left. Of course, 20 to 21, we don't really count that because that was during COVID. A lot of the kids weren't in school. So I always look back, when I start looking at numbers again, I look at 21 and beyond. So 21 to 22, we went to 610 referrals. That's a regular school year. And then last year, we went, we dropped to 589. At this point, we're um, projected to be lower than where we were last year in terms of discipline. Okay, so this is, this is the data we're tracking. It's important. Social emotional learning is important. And not to just give a program, yeah, but the teachers had to get trained. Because a lot of this didn't have to do with the students alone. It was about us, the adults. Me, the principal. All right, um, number of office referrals in terms of um, fighting. Pre-COVID, over 100 fights. Um, last year, we were down to maybe 20. Yeah, we had 20 fights last year. Bullying incidents, we went from 13 pre-COVID. Last year, we had two bullying incidents. The other piece of data that we had to make sure we were paying attention to were the African-American students were only 30% of our population and they were highly represented in the discipline data. So we're um, paying attention to how well we're doing that because that's some, like, like I said, it goes back to us as adults, um, how we interact with our African-American students, making sure that we are building relationships with them, even if they're different from, you know, from us in terms of um, their background and all that. So um, I'm, we're seeing way more positive interactions between African-American kids and teachers. So this is why I wanted to quit, because you know, I didn't know what to do when I have 25 students having suicidal ideations in 21, 22. Self-harm went from eight during COVID to five, and then it went up last year. This year, first semester, we've only had two self-harm incidents. Harm to others went up last year. Because you know, when you apply treatment, sometimes you do see a spike in your data, but then we fell off this year. So, Harm to others, we had 19 incidents last year. Not incidents, I should say threats to harm somebody else. This year, we've only had five first semester. Um, suicide attempt, last year was rough for me, y'all. You're sitting in a meeting and you get an email from your counselor saying, hey, I gotta put something in to the system because one of your kids just tried to, attempt, uh, try to harm him or herself. I had a kid to try it twice. Principals are going through this stuff, you know? I had 10 last year. This year, thank God, zero first semester. Suicide ideation went from 21, 25 to 40 last year. I don't know what happened last year, but we had 40 last year, and then this year, two first semester. And then others had to do with just other interactions um, that we had to deal with. So this data is just to, to show y'all that really, if we did not have access to those extra funds, and let me just say this, if it was like Title I and Title II where it's, it's earmarked for a specific thing, it would not have worked. I think it was successful because we were able to do with it what we needed to do with it to be successful in our schools. Because my school is different from the other schools. I was the only school who did capturing kids' hearts. The other schools didn't need it in the district because my school was the one with the high discipline referrals. And the outcome for us has been so phenomenal that my teachers are staying. When I first got there, we, had, we needed double digits amount of teachers. Now I can't get people to tell me they're leaving or not. Like, you're going to leave? So I can't even hire because nobody will tell me because we don't have that many people who are trying to leave, 
right? Um, I think I have two that resigned this year out of a full staff because we're now seeing the benefits of what we've done to build relationship with each, each other and with our students. Um, and that's good, the sustainability, um, I'm not so much worried about it, it's just the intentionality of making sure we're building student leadership now, creating a plan for onboarding new teachers and students. So when the new teachers come in our building, they understand that we build relationship with kids and it's not just about ABC 123, it's about the interaction that you have with students every day. Um, improving vertical alignment with regards to SEL, making sure that we know what's coming to us from the elementary school and being prepared to, to handle that in terms of small group counseling. Um, and also differentiating, differentiating our approach for each grade level. Sixth graders are different from seventh graders and seventh graders are totally different from eighth graders. So that's some of the work that we're gonna be doing to make sure that we can carry this thing out um, without the SR funds, because the cliff is coming. Thank y'all so much.